Self-delusion is something all humans do beneath their awareness. We stay in an abusive relationship. We linger in a dead-end job. We don't mean to do it deliberately, but might we softly intend to forget certain facts and experiences, suppressing those events which we can instantly tell will likely disprove or send shockwaves through our worldview, perhaps even rupturing our social identity. Instinctively, we don't let those dark thoughts in. We cling like a shivering orphan to our families, to our friends, to our status, and to our childish dreams. I recently watched a YouTube video called Jehovah's Witnesses, Fred France Talks a Little History. Afterwards, I theorized, what if, what if certain individuals on the governing body are just as duped by end-time prophecies as their followers? Are they not, to a limited degree, grant you, men to be pitied? Does the tendency to self-delude provide an absolving excuse for the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses? No. No more than this propensity forgives the inquisitions of the 12th century, or any other crimes visited upon humanity by ecclesiastical councils of times gone by. No. This quirk of the human mind, this disease of kings, this does not let the leadership of JW.org off the proverbial hook. There is no excuse for abusing the good faith and trust of millions, but there are reasons. In their pride, living as luxuriously as they do in a world of pure imagination, the governing body cannot humbly admit their errors. To do so would result could result in a mental breakdown, or perhaps a stroke at their crumpled, sun-dried ages. It may be, for them, an almost biological and neurological necessity that they cling to their, to their beliefs, as their millions of struggling followers do, clinging to their families, to their friends, to their status, to their childish delusions. What is especially tragic here is that an ancient book is being used to enslave millions worldwide. And it has been used this way for centuries. Since the reports of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection were first released, calculating men have used the appealing character of the Christ to attract and entrap guileless ones. How many of these multi-ringed, diamond cuff-linked, mega-church preachers have received in their own minds inklings throughout their lives that their beliefs were not well-founded? What would you do if faced with choosing between confronting religious doubts or continuing to live in a comfortable lifestyle to which you have become accustomed. Let's not pretend that it's an easy choice for these men to make. Rationalizations come easy. I have a family to support, or if I'm wrong, God knows I meant well. But in the quest for truth, comfort is not a priority. Nor can it be. Habit and tradition serve only to muddy the waters of the mind. Yet it is natural to seek to justify one's life, one's choices, and finally, one's cherished beliefs. Religious conviction can begin as Smeagol's find, but become Gollum's precious ring, bestowing both power and madness. Has not the Bible been employed by countless Christ-centered groups 
from the first century CE onward? And has it not been used to soothe the consciences of soldiers in countless conflicts? How well it has served to elevate the status of stentorian con artists in a traveling circus tent of hellfire preachers, sweaty hell, hay bale revivals, and carnival Christianity. What a mess. Religion provides the invisible support needed to commit a highly visible series of historical atrocities. Did not the slave owners of 18th century North America find scripture to justify and even instruct them in the care, feeding, and production of human livestock? Who or what is to blame for all the blood guilt religious interpretations have wrought upon mankind? And how do we start to heal our race so that we may avoid repeating these twisted patterns of exploitation? Can the members of the governing body of any religious or organization be persuaded to relinquish their ill-gotten gains? Or what about the overseers who feel themselves to be next in line? Can they be reasoned with? Not likely. And if history is any indication, change must come either from the bottom up and from within the organization or or help will come with hoofbeats from beyond the horizon and from a judicial body backed with ammunition more explosive than mere chapter and verse. In short, a governing body that outweighs the governing body needs to come to the rescue. Who will that be? Will the United Nations or a group like it address the human rights abuses of Jehovah's Witnesses as these come into public view? Will the media continue to reveal the underhanded tactics like lying to police and judges of this so-called theocratic warfare? To some students of history, the fall of Jehovah's Witnesses and groups like them may seem inevitable. But how sad it will be for those clingers, those desperate golems, who, with fingers now blackened into claws, cut into the soft flesh of their fellow worshipers, clutching for an ounce of prestige in a dying organization. They all do If one thing I know I fall but I grow I'm walking down this road of mine This road that I go home So am I